How many had a wonderful Christmas? All right. How many ate too much for Christmas? All right. But how many are planning on eating a lot this week as well? All right. Hey, listen, your diet does not have to start until the new year. So we got four or five days to just absolutely blow it. So I wanted to ask today, who, who this week received just an absolutely fantastic gift? You opened this fantastic gift, and you want to tell us what you opened. I got a hand right over here. All right, so somebody's over here. So t- yeah, you raised your hand. You raised your hand. Tell me, what did you open? What gift did you open? A Nintendo DS. A Nintendo (laughs) DS. Fantastic. Who else? Who else? What gift did you get? An Xbox One. An Xbox One. And all of us that are adults know exactly what these things are, don't we? Uh, Gil, what did you get? Can you lift your voice loud? I got one of these beautiful bird cages, so I need a bird to hand us through the bush. (laughs) All right. He said he got a, a bird cage. Is that right? I would venture to say you were the only person in our entire church that got a birdcage for Christmas. Uh, I would venture to say that. Uh, who else got a wonderful gift that you want to mention today? Who else got one? This lady right here. What did you get? A computer. A computer. That's fantastic. Tammy? My grandbaby. Your grandbaby. Well, that's the that. That might be the best right there. That actually transitions into what I was going to say because did anybody receive a life changing gift. This, uh, this, I mean, a, a gift that would be life changing. I was hoping they would be here and they could tell the story. So, so, so what is your life changing gift that you received? An engagement. An engagement. Look at that. Let's give them, let's give them a hand. That is a baby and an engagement. Those are, those are life changing gifts. Anybody else receive a life changing gift? Richie. All right, but we got baby news all over the place. Baby news all over the place. We're actually, we have this bed at our house because we didn't celebrate Christmas yet. This was our first, we, we kind of did our first empty nest Christmas this year because Justin and Jenny and Isabella are in Guatemala and, you know, Mark got married and then what's he do? His very first Christmas being married, him and his wife hop on a plane and they leave us all by themselves, <laughs> left us Christmas morning. And so, uh, but we're going to, uh, the, they come back next week and then Justin and Jenny and Isabella come in from Guatemala. So we have this running bed in our family. Is, are Justin and Jenny going to give us news of another grandbaby? And so we have, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. Probably not. But, uh, but life-changing news. Well, the, the, the reason I did all of that, because in the story that we're looking at today, we're studying several men who, who opened a gift, who received news of a gift that literally would transform their lives, that literally would change their lives. And obviously, you know what gift I'm referring to. I'm referring to the gift of Jesus Christ, which is the ultimate gift. We're in the middle of a series that we've called Unwrapping Jesus, the ultimate gift. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We'll read just a few verses and uh, study this this fantastic story in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read just verses 8 through 14 for the time being. We'll look at a few verses in a little bit. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. You know the story. Let me read it. You follow along. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. I want you to catch that phrase, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom 
he is pleased. Would you pray with me today? Lord, this has been such an awesome week. Lord, it's been a great week as we've been able to spend time with family and friends. Um, Lord, you blessed us in our country far more than we could ever deserve. Probably the majority of us have eaten more this week than many people around the world. We've received gifts and we've been able to give gifts. Lord, thank you so much for the awesomeness of this time of year. But Lord, help us to be reminded once again today of the fact that you are the greatest gift of all. Lord, today we've heard some some great gifts that people have received, some gifts that even have transformed lives. And yet, Lord, help us to see in this story that uh, you, as our greatest gift, desire to transform each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to see that in today's story. We love you in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, today we wrap up our series on unwrapping Jesus. You get the word play there? We wrap up our series on unwrapping Jesus. Nobody gets that. I work a long time on those things, and nobody really catches that. All right, so we wrap up the series today. Thus far, we've seen that uh, we've seen Jesus as our Redeemer. Uh, remember there in Matthew chapter 1, he was prophesied as he would save his people from their sins. Remember a couple of weeks ago, Jose preached a, a great message on the fact that, that he is Emmanuel, God with us, the ever-present God with us. He is always present. Last week, we saw that he was worthy of our worship, and we studied uh, the Magi, or the Magi as they traveled, Lord, uh, from, the far, or from the Far East to Bethlehem, searching for Jesus, realizing that he is worthy of worship. Then Wednesday night, we, or excuse me, on Thursday night on Christmas Eve, we saw that, that he's humble. Uh, so we talked about, you might not have been here on Christmas Eve, but of all the words that describe the incarnation, I'm not sure there's a better word than the word humility, the fact that he was humble, that he left the glories, the comfort, the significance, the love of heaven to come to a world of discomfort, to come to a world of insignificance, to come to a world of hate, the giver of life, became the victim of death. We see that illustrated in the incarnation. In, in, in today's message, we see just one word. It's a word that we saw two times in the passage, and it is the word glory. Now, notice once again, if you have your Bibles in verse 9, it says, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And then in verse 14, the, the angels come and the angels declare, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So this morning we ask ourselves, what does the term glory mean? It says the glory of God shone among them, and then they praised God, saying glory to God in the highest. Well, first of all, we know that glory or gloria is a name. We have several people in our congregation that are named glory or gloria. How many glory or glorias do we have in the congregation today? I know we have, uh, I know we have a couple right down here. I told uh, Gil and Gloria this morning that I, I told Gloria, I said, I'm preaching on your name. And she said, well, Brian, I want you to know the church that we came from several years ago had a huge banner with my name right on it. They recognized me every single Sunday. And then Gil said, and Brian, every Sunday I sang to my wife. I sang glory. He, he sang it better than I did right there. But anyways, we know that, that glory, glory and glory is a name. The, the term that's used here comes from the Greek word doxa, from which we get our word doxology. You might be familiar with the term doxology. It's a word that's found 200, or 167 times in the New Testament. It, it literally means to give an opinion of value. So the idea being that when we give God glory, we're what? We are recognizing his value. We are recognizing his worth, that he is worth 
everything worth more than anyone else. Many times, though, when the word is used throughout the New Testament, it means this, and this is what I put in your notes. It means the manifestation of God's presence. And so whenever we see the term glory, often it's talking about the manifestation of of God's presence. Let me show you a couple of verses. We'll put them up on your screen. I listed the text in your notes. Notice, first of all, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, talking about Jesus, and it says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his, notice the word, we have seen his what? His glory. That's the Greek word doxa. We've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here's the idea. When Jesus came, the Apostle John said, we realized, we recognized that he was not just a man, that he was what? He was the very Son of God. We saw his glory. We recognized his value. John chapter 17 and verse 5, Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer. And Jesus says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So here's Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to Calvary, and he says, man, Father, glorify me. Help me to to experience, to have the same glory, the same value that you and I had before the world was ever created. Here's a third time that the word is used in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. The writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus Christ and he says, he is the radiance of what? The glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature. And so in each of those verses, it's talking about what? It's talking about the manifestation of God's presence. Now, I don't want you to walk away today saying, okay, here's what I got. I have to wait for an angelic appearance so that I can experience the glory of God, so that I can experience God's presence in my life. No, 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 and God probably is not going to appear to you or me in the form of an angel. But today we experience God's glory in a variety of ways. We experience God's glory through his word. As we read the word of God, the reality of Jesus' person is what? Is revealed to us. His presence, his person is manifested to us. Uh, His presence is manifested through his protection and through his provision. I shared, I spoke in the Spanish church just a few moments ago, and I shared that I am absolutely convinced of the fact that we frequently fail to recognize the fact that God is actively at work in our lives. God's actively working. Things happen, we take credit for it. All right, things happen, well, that's just chance. And we fail to see what? God's alive. And, And God is at work. And God is manifesting his person and his presence in our lives through his protection, through his provision through his peace, through his presence that he feels or that we feel. He has promised to be with us even during the most difficult moments of our life. Some of you I know have been through unbelievably difficult moments and it's in those dark valleys as you walk through the valley of sickness or you walk through the valley of separation from family or as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you feel what? You feel the very presence of God with you. Why is that? Because he's promised to never leave us or forsake us. So here's the question that I want us to see today. So what happens when we experience the glory of God. What happens whenever God demonstrates his glory, when God manifests his presence in our lives? We see how these shepherds responded. And, and my goal is for me and for us to not only look at the story and read it and say, what a cool story, but for us to be able to imitate their response. In other words, as God demonstrates his presence and his power in our lives, how should we respond to him? I wrote down four things, four simple things in your outline. The first thing that I wrote down is this, God's glory exposes us for who we really 
are. Think about that. God's glory exposes us for who we really are. To me, it's very interesting to whom the angelic announcement of Jesus' birth was given. Think about that. If you and I would have been given the uh, unbelievable responsibility of announcing the birth of the Messiah, how would we have announced it? I find it interesting that the angel was not sent to Herod's palace saying, you got to tell the Judean king first. That's not to whom the angel was sent. The angels were not sent to the religious leaders of the day. They weren't sent to the temple there in Jerusalem, to the high priest, to the priests, to the Levites. I mean, uh, I would have thought that's where you start, but that's not where the angel went with the announcement. Christ's birth was not announced in the Bethlehem Beacon. It wasn't publicized in the Jerusalem Journal. It wasn't on the internet, and as far as I know, there wasn't a single TV newscaster that announced the birth of Jesus. Who announced it? And to whom was it announced? We find that the angel was dispatched to a few shepherds on a Judean hillside. hillside. Now, let's not romanticize today who these shepherds were. You and I see shepherds today, and we have kind of this, this, uh, this idealistic, romantic idea of what shepherds were and how we view them. But in Christ's day, shepherds stood at the bottom rung of the Palestinian social ladder. Shepherds shared the same unenviable status with tax collectors and dung sweepers. Shepherds were seen as vagrants. They were viewed by society as thieves. They were not allowed in the temple. The average person could walk in the temple. Shepherds weren't allowed in the temple because they handled animals and they were viewed as dirty. Their testimony was not admissible in a court of law. They were viewed as dishonest. They were viewed as men without integrity. Jewish historians tell us that the most pious of Jews would not buy milk or wool from shepherds because they assumed that what the shepherd was selling was stolen. Shepherds were despised. They were rejected. They were seen as wicked and depraved. One one philosopher from Alexandria wrote this about shepherds. There is no more disreputable an occupation than that of a shepherd. They cannot be trusted. They are brutes, thieving, deplorable men who prefer the company of animals and other men than they do community life. It was precisely to those men that the proclamation of Jesus' birth came. The angel came to shepherds. Notice the response in, in verse 10, or the end of verse 9. It simply says this, And they were filled with great fear. I ask questions as I read through the text, and I asked myself the question, Why were they afraid? Why were they filled with great fear? Well, you might sit back and say, Brent, that's a stupid question because an angel just showed up. They were in, the, in this Judean hillside. It was quiet. Uh, there was no noise around. And all of a sudden, this angel and this choir of angels came, and it scared them. I believe that that was partly it. But I believe that they were afraid because the glory of God revealed their true condition. The, the, the glory of God exposed the shepherds, for who they really were. You see, as they're out in the Judean hillside, they're with other shepherds. They're cool. But when all of a sudden they are placed in a position in which they are exposed to the glory, the magnificence, the perfection of God, all of a sudden their sinful condition was exposed and they saw themselves as they really were. Were. Now, let's not be too judgmental of them today, because if you and I had an experience in which we experienced the manifestation of God's presence, we would respond in the exact same way. Let me try to illustrate just a little bit, silly illustration, okay? Here at 
Hollywood Christian School, we have all kinds of grades. And so let's imagine one day I walk in the gymnasium and there's a bunch of first graders, five-year-olds in the gymnasium. So I walk in the gymnasium and there's what about, Mike, about what, 18, 20 kids in each class. And so I start walking in and this first grade class is in the gym and I start talking smack to all those five-year-olds. And I start telling them, you know what? I'm better than all of you. As a matter of fact, give me a basketball. Give me a basketball. I can, I can dunk on all of you. I, well, I actually couldn't dunk because you'd have to be able to jump that high. But if you gave me a ladder and I could jump, I could dunk on them, all right? But I could score on all of those five-year-olds. Well, as a matter of fact, I could probably score on, at will on those five-year-olds. And I'm talking, I'm looking at him saying, hey, let's get down to the floor right now. Let's do push-ups. How many push-ups can you do? I can do more push-ups than any five-year-old in the class. How smart are you? I, I'm smarter than you are. How much money do you have in your piggy bank? A couple of quarters or something? I got, I got a few dollars in my bank account. I, as I compare myself to five-year-olds, who am I? I'm Superman, man. I mean, nobody can stop me. Nobody can control me. I can score at will. I'm comparing myself to them. But all of a sudden, in the gymnasium walks LeBron James. And what happens? The situation completely changes, right? I'm no longer the strongest person in the gym. I'm no longer the best basketball player in the gym. I no longer can do more push-ups than anybody else in the gym. I'm certainly no longer the wealthiest person in the gym. What happened? Everything has changed. I'm no longer comparing myself to five-year-olds. I, myself now, am the five-year-old compared to LeBron James. Now listen, silly illustration. But at times, we, as Paul says, we compare ourselves by ourselves. And we have a tendency to look around and, well, you know what? Of all the people in the auditorium, I'm, I'm pretty good I'm in pretty good shape here. I think God's really pleased with me. As a matter of fact, maybe I read my Bible as much as anybody in here, and maybe I got spiritual strength as much as anybody in here, and I'm really good. I'm feeling really good about myself. Until what? Until all of a sudden God walks in the room. God walks in the room, and what changes? Everything changes. The entire situation changes. Changes. You see, when the glory of God shows up, we see ourselves as we really are. Every bit of swagger, every bit of our confidence, every bit of self-justification melts away in the light of his glory. That's what we see taking place with the shepherds. The glory of God showed up, and they saw themselves as they really were. We see that truth all throughout Scripture. Let me show you another passage of Scripture. We're going to put Isaiah chapter 6 up on the screen. In, in Isaiah, here's what's taking place. Isaiah is, is, a, is a prophet to Israel, and he is, he is pronouncing judgment on the Israelites. As a matter of fact, if you read the first five chapters of Isaiah, here's, here's the summation of what Isaiah is saying. He's looking at the Jews, and he's saying, Woe are you. You're a bunch of sorry, no good sinners. And over and over again, he's condemning them for who they are. And rightfully so, he was the prophet. But as we come to Isaiah chapter 6, something happens. Isaiah catches a glimpse of God. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Isaiah is talking. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Verse 2. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse 3, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of, notice the word, his what? His glory. Verse 4, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah's description ends. Here's Isaiah's response. And I said, woe is me. The first five chapters, he's saying, woe are you. Now he says, woe is me. 
for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What has changed? My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, church, the simple truth is this. The glory of God reveals our sinful condition. The glory of God exposes us for who we really are. You see, the simple truth is this. If you've never come to grips with who you really are, the reason for that is you've never seen God as he is. Because when you and I see God as he really is, it changes us. It changes our perspective as to who we are. I won't take the time to go there, but in the beginning of the book of Revelation, we see it illustrated again. John, who was maybe the closest disciple to Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, You'll remember, John always in his gospel describes himself as the disciple who leaned his head against the Lord's chest. I mean, what was the idea? That they were extremely close. And yet when John sees Jesus in the beginning of the book of Revelation, in all of his glory, John doesn't sit back and say, Hey, buddy Jesus, I've missed you. How does John respond? He falls on his face before God as if he were dead. You see, the glory of God exposes us for who we really are. We see that with the shepherds here on a Judean hillside. Let me show you a second thing. God's glory replaces fear with joy. God's glory replaces fear with joy. You see, in the midst of their fright, the very first thing that the angel says to them is, do not fear. Now, first of all, how is it possible? You're in the presence of a, of, a, of a celestial being. How is it possible not to fear? But not only that, you have just come to realize that you are coming face to face with a holy God who is righteous, who is just, a God who rages against sin. Let me pause for a second because in our day and age, I mean, sin has become almost a, uh, a, a, a politically incorrect word. And, and in our day and age, we're, f- we're afraid to talk about sin. And yet, quite frankly, whenever we see God as he really is, it exposes our sinful condition and it motivates us to want to change. The shepherds were afraid. But the message of the angel is, don't be afraid, for I bring you Good news, which will result in great joy. Two things. Uh, I wrote in my notes. They're not in yours. You can write them down in yours. Fear was replaced with joy because they were given good news. Fear was replaced with joy because they were given good news. Have you ever had anybody look at you and say, hey, I've got good news and bad news? Or I've got bad news and good news. Which do you want first? Hear about the man who went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I got good news and bad news. What do you want? And the guy says, well, give me the good news. And the doctor says, well, the good news is that you have uncurable cancer, and you only have 24 hours to live. The man said, that's the good news. What, is the, what in the world is the bad news? The doctor said, I've been trying to call you for 24 hours. That's the bad news, all right? Uh, I heard about a pastor that they said, hey, pastor, the good news is our church attendance is way up. That's excellent. What's the bad news? You've been gone for the last three Sundays. (laughs) Or I heard about the attorney who, uh, I love this one, the defense attorney who told his client, first of all, I want to give you the bad news, all right? The bad news is that the blood test came back and your DNA is found all over the victim's clothing. Oh my word, what's the good news? The good news is your cholesterol's down to 140 points. <laughs> all right, I like that one. They didn't even get that. I told that in Spanish. It went right over their heads. They didn't get that one at all, right? Hey, hey, the glory of God had demonstrated bad news to the shepherds. 
The glory of God revealed, it exposed them for who they really were. But now the angel tells them, but I've got good news for you. I've got good news that will bring you great joy. The word that is translated good news in, in, uh, in, ver- in the verse that we read just a few moments ago is a derivative from the word in which we get our word gospel. You've heard of the word gospel, the good news of salvation. That's the exact same word. As a matter of fact, the word good news in this verse is the same word that is used for Jesus whenever he preaches the gospel of the kingdom over and over again. He's what? He's declaring good news. The term means specifically to announce, to proclaim, or to preach the, the good news of of the gospel. So here's the idea. The idea was that the angel preached a message to them. The angels not only sang, and by the way, we always say that the angelic choir sang. There's no mention of them singing in the passage. They probably did, but it says that they said or they declared. The angel specifically preached the good news to the shepherds. He communicated a message of good news, a message which brought them great joy. Notice their fear was replaced with joy, first of all, because they heard good news, but secondly, because they were told the birth or about the birth of a Savior. Here's what the angel says. I've got good news. For today, I'm announcing the birth of a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It's interesting, the angel uses three terms to describe the baby that was born in Bethlehem. The first thing he says is this, he is the Savior. It's the word that we studied in the very beginning of the series, Redeemer, the preserver of life, the deliverer, the one who has come to redeem us from our sins. I've got good news, the Redeemer has born, has been born. But not only is he the Redeemer, but he is what? He is the Christ, the anointed one. This is the word that is used for the Messiah, the coming Messiah. So the angel says, not only has the Savior been born, but the Messiah that you are waiting for has been born as well. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. The word Lord there means owner. It means master. It's found 722 times in the New Testament. So, so, so here, here's kind of an application that, that kind of fit my life, and I trust it, it fits yours. Because all of us have times of fear in our lives. Do, do we not? I mean, all of us have times. The bravest person here has times in which you're fearful. The bravest person here has times in which situations cause us to be afraid. Maybe it's news that the doctor's given us. Maybe it's that phone call that we have dreaded receiving and that phone call comes. Maybe it's the pink slip that the boss gives us and we're sitting back fearful, not knowing what the future holds. All of us have times of fear in our life. How do we, how should we confront those fearful times in our life? by this good news. He says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news because a Savior who is Christ the Lord has been born. Because when Jesus came, he came as our Redeemer, paying the price for all of our sins, so much so that there is now no condemnation to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. He is the anointed one, the one who is prophesied from the Old Testament, and he desires to be the Lord of your life, the owner, the the master. He desires to take control of your life. You can trust in him, even in those moments when you and I fear the most. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Let me show you a third thing in the text. God's glory creates trust in the word of God. You see, whenever you and I experience the glory of God, it creates trust in the word of God. Notice in verse 15, we didn't read it. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them, from the shepherds into heaven, 
the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. I love how these shepherds responded upon, upon hearing God's message. They didn't stop. They didn't sit back and analyze and say, now wait a second, did that really happen? How is that? Let's theologize for a moment what is taking place. Is God really able to send his angel? Was that really an angel? Do we have a responsibility to do and to hear what he says? That's not the way they responded. They heard God's message, and they what? They immediately responded to God's word. As a matter of fact, in the text it says, let's go. I love how it says in Spanish. In Spanish it says, vamos, let's go, come on, get moving. God gave us a command. What is our response? Our response is to obey God's command and to do what God has told us to do. You see, there is this childlike wonderment that builds confidence in what God said that is now driving them to see what God said would be waiting for them in Bethlehem. I read that and thought, man, what a, what a great lesson for us. You see, when we get a true manifestation of God's glory, when we catch a glimpse of who he is, we no longer question God's word. We take what God tells us at face value, and we do it. Old adage I heard years ago, but it is so true. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Have you heard that before? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You see, we live in a postmodern world that rationalizes the Word of God. Whether, whether we admit that we do it intentionally or not, we, we do. Biblical commands are, are no longer commands for us. They're biblical suggestions for us. And, and we feel to a certain degree, we never verbalize it, but we feel to a certain degree as if God has placed us over his Word and we have the ability to determine what parts of God's word we should obey and what parts of God's word we shouldn't obey. So, so in our culture, we have many believers today that almost approach, their hermeneutical approach to, uh, approach to Scripture is almost with a pair of scissors saying, okay, this applies to me, but this doesn't apply to me. Yeah, this applied to somebody in a different generation at a different time, but it doesn't apply to me anymore. Brian, come on. The world has changed. The world is different. God certainly doesn't expect of us what he, have expe what he expected of the people back in the first century. And we what? We become the judges of the word of God. And we obey what we want to obey. But that which is uncomfortable for us that which changes our lifestyle, we kind of push aside. And, and that's, that's really not for me today. Now, could you imagine these, these shepherds could have sat back and rationalized, what do you mean go to Bethlehem? We have sheep to take care of. All right, uh, well, that's not an easy journey. We've got to climb down from the hillside, and man, we stink. We smell like sheep. What do you mean we're going to show up and see? I mean, they could have rationalized the command in a thousand different ways. But when they heard from God, their response was what? Let's go. Let's go see. Let's, let's obey the voice of the angel. Sit back sometimes and wonder, what would it be like if believers, we sat back today and we said, I'm going to obey God's word no matter what. If it's convenient, if it's inconvenient, all right? If it's culturally accepted, if it's not culturally accepted, I am going to obey God's I think it's more than that, though. I think 
the reason we don't obey. The reason, the reason why it's so easy for us to discard certain aspects of God's word is on a regular basis, we don't catch a glimpse of God. We fail to see God as he really is. And so it's easy for us to not obey his word. You see, God's glory creates trust in the word of God. God's glory prompts us to be obedient to his word. Let me give you a fourth thing and we're done. God's glory changes your perspective on life. When, when you catch a glimpse of the glory of God, it changes your perspective on life. Here's what's taking place. I'm not going to read verses, verses 16, 17, and 18, but, but the shepherds take this command by God to go to Bethlehem. They go to Bethlehem. They find the child, just as the angel says, you'll find the child wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. They go and they find Jesus, just as the angel describes. And no doubt they have this life-changing experience. They've obeyed the word of God. They've seen the child of God. They've worshipped the child of God. And notice verse 20, the last verse. Notice verse 20. It says this, and the shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen or all that they had heard and seen just as it had been told them. Now think with me. Nothing had changed. They were still shepherds. They were still the lowest on the Palestinian social ladder. Their testimony still was not valid in courts. They still were not allowed to enter into the temple. They still were viewed as vagrants and thieves and reproachable people in their society. Their circumstances had not changed. What had changed? Their perspective. Their perspective completely changed. Why is that? For they had seen the king. They had seen the Messiah. And when they saw the Messiah, it changed their perspective of life. Now, we don't get the rest of the story. I would love to be able to tell you, here's what's happened in the shepherd's life. The shepherd's life, the lives completely changed. They went back and, man, they, they went and got an education. And, man, they become respectable people of society. One of them became a lawyer. And the guy who couldn't testify in court was now working in court. I'd love to be able to tell you the rest of the story. But the rest of the story's not there in Scripture. I'm, I'm pretty confident that they're, they're, they're meeting with Jesus transformed their life. But as of yet, their life had not been transformed. Their circumstances were still the same. What had changed was their perspective. Their perspective on life. Oh, I meet with people all the time, and you know, the responses are this. Brian, if only my circumstances were different. Man, Brian, if only my marriage was stronger than it was, then I could really worship the Lord and I could really serve the Lord. Man, Brian, if I just had a better job and it wasn't so much of a struggle day in and day out, I could really worship the Lord and I could really serve the Lord. Man, Brian, you know what? If, if, if our living conditions were better, man, we're living with, with, with extended family and it's just, it's difficult. If our circumstances were different, I could really worship the Lord. Listen, your worship and my worship must not be determined by our circumstances. We must live above our circumstances. As a matter of fact, I believe that our circumstances will not change until our perspective changes. And when our perspective changes, we see God as he really is, and we worship him and honor him, then we're motivated to do what? To change our circumstances. These, these shepherds still had a difficult road ahead of them, but they returned to their fields praising and worshiping and glorifying God. Why is that? They saw things just as God said they would be. 
they experienced the glory of God. So let me ask you today, when was the last time that you experienced the glory of God? When was the last time that worship just wasn't routine for you? You came to church with an expectation of God is there. And by the way, absolutely irrelevant what the worship is like, what the preaching is like, whether the lights are on, whether the lights are off, whether the person beside you smells good or smells terrible. All of that is irrelevant. You know why? Because God is here. He's here. He's here today. He has promised to be here. He has promised to say, man, whenever there's a handful of people that are gathered together in my name, guess what? I'm here. And so my prayer ought to be, God, as I come together with your people on Sunday morning, help me to sense your presence. Oh, God, help me to experience your power. God, manifest yourself to me in a powerful way today. God, change my life. God, change my perspective. And we catch a glimpse of the glory of God. And his glory, what? It changes us. It causes us to see ourselves as we, we stop seeing everybody else as they are, and we start seeing ourselves as we really are. It takes the fear out of our lives, replaces it with joy, gives us a trust in the word of God to apply God's word to our life, and all of a sudden, life has changed. Maybe the circumstances haven't, but perspective has changed. And I can say with the Apostle Paul, it doesn't matter what situation I'm in, I'm content. I've had a lot, I've had very little, and I've learned to be content wherever God places me. Why is that? Because God's in my life, and I experience his glory in my life. There's been a time in your life when you've really seen yourself for who you are. You've repented of your sins and you've trusted Jesus Christ and Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, that's where it starts. And believers, let's, it's so easy. I've been a believer for 30 years. I understand. Let's not allow, let's not allow the Christian life to become routine. Let's not allow it to become just rote and something we do on a regular basis. But let's look for, let's seek out, let's experience the presence and the power of God in our lives.